Every year, rivers and streams descending from China, Nepal, Bhutan and India join together and overflow, flooding and nourishing the Bangladeshi soil throughout the long monsoon months. We're in Daud Kandy, two hours southeast of Dhaka, the capital, in late August. This apparently hostile environment is the setting for an incredible human adventure. This is the story of a few thousand farmers and one NGO who turned the floods into an extraordinary opportunity. When I first went to Daud Kandi 15 years ago, it was very different. Back then, people were totally dependent on agriculture. Because their lands were low and located near water courses, they could only produce one crop a year due to flooding. I realized that the community had started to develop a fishery which very quickly became a private company. When you think about it, they turned the flooding into an asset on soil that couldn't produce anything for four to five months. Fish farming allowed them to increase both their production and their income. And the fish also gave them protein, which they were lacking. All of this transformed their lives in an extraordinary way. Suppose you're a farmer. You can only work six to eight months a year. The rest of the time you wait, helpless for the floods to subside. And it's the same for all your neighbors. One day, someone comes along and tells you you can earn extra money during the rainy season by growing fish in your rice fields. That someone was Morshed. It was, so difficult, to it was so difficult to get everyone to understand that this adventure would be possible, that the community could find the money to do it, that we could prevent the fish from escaping, that we could feed and harvest the fish from there. It took Morshed two years to convince the communities to invest their money and build a fishing company together. Those young people over there, do they know how all this started? There have been around a hundred projects just in this area and more now in the rest of Bangladesh. We need to keep this story alive or it will be forgotten because there were only 10 to 12 of us who were there when it began. So, can you tell us? No, I don't know. Our youth only remembers anything if there's a profit to be had. Twenty years ago, Morshed worked for a map-making company. His work took him to the Daud Kadi region, where he became friends with the local people. While studying the maps, he realized that certain flooded areas would be suitable for fish farming. He became convinced that if the villagers exploited those lands, they could earn extra money. He decided to develop a program through Shishuk, the NGO he had just founded. Around that time, he heard about a call for fish farming projects and submitted his idea. The Ford Foundation was the main donor of this call for proposals. They came to see me and they said, it's a great idea, but you're too young to handle it. It was a 20 square kilometer. I'd identified a flood zone of 20 square kilometers that was already enclosed by the road and an embankment with three water regulators. This zone also contained a small river, seven kilometers long. My idea was to preserve wild fishing in this little river so that the farmers could continue to fish, while converting the rest of the flood zone into a fish farm, which would allow the landowners to earn more money. And, you know, other community, the landowners can really generate income from the fish culture. So that was the whole idea. That was my idea. In the end, the project didn't get supported. 
I decided to but really I decided to go ahead anyway uh, go with a less ambitious then, idea. Uh, I decided to make my proposal a bit more. I realistic. said to myself, let's and see I, what we can I do without any donors. What we can do without any donor. Pratham the Shishu NGO introduced us to the managers. They organized many meetings and they explained lots of things, all the advantages, the benefits. We understood that it was in our interest to do it. We spent a lot of time talking about it. Some were for it, some against. Some people will always be against anything new. As soon as anyone shows leadership in this country, someone will disagree. If someone says, let's do this project, someone else will say, no, we don't need it. We're fine without this project. At the time, there were two groups who really butted heads. Even the police got involved. When the project began, I thought that if we joined, it would make life more difficult for us as farmers. The fields would be damaged, that it would mess up the boundaries between our lands, and that we wouldn't get our money back. That's what I thought, and my wife too, that we would give them money, but in the end it would be money lost. When it was time to set up the project, they gathered us together and said, each share is worth 10 euros. If you have 1,200 square meters of land, that's three shares, so 30 euros. Once we'd put together the money from all the shares and marked off the boundaries of the fishery, we got to work. A large portion of the capital went into building the infrastructure the dams and water gates that would retain and control the water. Little by little, the villages became connected and a whole new environment was created. Once we'd finished building the infrastructure, we bought small fish, we put them in the water, we gave them food, and they grew. Once they were big, we started selling them, and we shared the profits. At first, profits were low, but within two years, a whole new local economy, an entire value chain had sprung up. Jobs were created in harvesting, sorting and selling fish. Some of the shareholders created new companies to supply fish feed, ice and transportation. Many people were able to multiply their sources of income in this way. Any big ones? Yes, even bigger than that one. Some are five kilos. Oh, really big ones then? I do many things. I grow rice, I have shares in the fishery, and I also work for the fishery. So, all in all, I make a good living. My life has completely changed. Like everyone, I used to dream of moving to the city. When you don't own a house or a car, it's easy to imagine starting up a little business in town, in computers, say. But the money doesn't come back to the village, and that's a big problem. By staying here in Dowd Candy, I've been able to develop my business and also to invest. 
I've become the second or third largest business around here. I'm financially stable and I bought more land with my own money in my name. I've become a recognized businessman in the area, all thanks to the fishery. Ibrahim had studied in the city, but then returned to his village. He watched the fishery evolve and seized his chance. Development initiatives in Bangladesh have focused mostly on the creation of cooperatives, with not much done to develop the private sector. In this case, the local people decided right from the start to set up a private initiative, a commercial enterprise. Landowners would get one or several shares. Even people who did not own land could purchase shares. And so a private sector was born. In Bangladesh, Every development effort before this one was based on cooperation. But in this particular case, it's based on business. That's the big innovation. Today, we realize that without business, there can be no growth. So from that point of view, it's a huge success. Little by little, the entire plain was transformed as neighboring villages created new fisheries with the help of the Shishuk NGO. Keen to involve the entire community and see everyone become a shareholder and entrepreneur, Shishuk negotiated two rules. Landowners couldn't own more than 20 shares, and each family without land would be allowed one share. Shishuk also invested its own money. We have a 20 to 25 percent share of the project. There are several different reasons for this. The first is that we want to remain part of this initiative. Of course, the most important thing is community ownership of the project. But it's also important to us that we be involved on the same level as the landowners. We don't want to be there just to be facilitators. We don't want to go to donors for money, and we don't want to charge the community for our services. On the other hand, we don't like to charge it to the community. So, to make things simpler, we decided to invest in the capital and in that way, we get our share of the dividends. We use that money to try to cover our management costs and community support. The other reason is that it allows us to pre-purchase 5 to 10% of shares for people without land. And that way, Landowners are less reluctant to refuse the inclusion of landless people in the project. If you see someone stealing fish, you must tell us. It's illegal not to tell us. You have to watch over the project. No need to catch the thief, just tell us. Here are our directors, Mrs. Bonira and Mrs. Kulsum. They are the people you must tell if anything happens. I'm a farmer and a director. I was elected by the farmers and it's my duty to look after them. 
I'm here to make sure the farmers get a good harvest and I'm committed to defending their interests. There are only two female directors in all the fisheries. Each fishery elects a board of directors of 10 to 20 people. This board is in charge of managing the fishery and handles everything from production to sales and profit sharing. Elections take place every two years. Only landowners with a surface area equal or superior to 1,200 square meters can stand for election, so that in case of embezzlement, the board can get compensation. The villagers convinced Kulsum to stand for director after she spoke out against illegal practices. Take my husband's uncles, for example. Together, they own the largest share of land in the project. When they began to rent it out, the surface area they declared was bigger than what they owned. According to my calculations, they doubled their surface area. This year, we levied all the extra money they've received over the past 10 years and put it back into the project. Before we started the lease system, people said that many directors were corrupt and declared more expenses. But that's not true. How can I do business without capital? Before, we had a small capital and we couldn't buy enough food for the fish. We had a contract with a store that gave us 30,000 euros worth of fish food that we had to repay within two months. But it's impossible to grow fish food in two months. You need three months at least. And because we couldn't feed the fish properly, our production was poor. In the beginning, everything went smoothly. Then there were disagreements among the directors, uh, responsibility issues. Some directors didn't pay out the dividends, and that's why we looked into the lease system. One day we had a meeting, there were 300 people. 200 agreed that it would be good to go for the lease system, so that's what we chose. It was the majority decision. Since then, subcontractors have managed the fishery. Elected directors examine bidding offers and make sure that dividends are paid. Now the farmers get paid on time. We give them the money before the monsoon and then we farm the fish. Everyone gets paid the proper amount. That's why we decided to go for the lease system. We're completely transparent about the money since the farmers get paid in advance. That way, they're the ones who manage the profits and the losses. It's not our problem or the community's problem anymore. We agree on a sum, and that sum is then distributed to the shareholders. Now everyone gets the money they're owed. It is not a lease in that sense. It is a it's not a lease more, in the true sense of the word. Uh, you know, management contract. It's more of a management contract, a subcontracting to community our, shareholders. Uh, our project to anybody. The project isn't open to outside investors. First, we want to make sure that a small group from the community will work hard and apply a business sense to becoming more efficient and producing the best results. And can make a better effort, more efficiently. Maybe, uh, Maybe next, next year, year we if we see that everything is going right well, track, we may we go may back to the original to system, principle, our, our that our is, without subcontractors. I mean, uh, it, it is just but a, for now, it's an evolution that, that aims to correct to, uh, and improve the way we operate and make things more efficient. But does this solution truly improve operations? Once people have been given a taste for business, isn't it logical that some will want to make more money by producing more fish? How much will you give me? How much? 
All right, come on, how much? Okay, okay, two, 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 three. Three, three, I got three. Four, 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 okay, five. Five? Can we get five euros? Okay, good, all right, good. Since we began subcontracting, we've joined the competition. We invest more money and produce more fish. That's why we earn more with increased production. That's the whole idea. Some of the directors, however, are also subcontractors. They group together to increase their capital and control the management of several fisheries. How is it possible to be sure that they aren't defending only their own interests? For Morshed, there's no conflict of interest. This is what we built. I mean, that is our real success. I think the same people can be shareholders, subcontractors and owners all at once. We don't bring in outsiders. We facilitate the community's involvement. People start out as small shareholders, then they become part of the board of directors and learn how to manage the fishery. And eventually they can subcontract the fishery as entrepreneurs. That's the success of the whole adventure. Before, when I sent fish to town, sometimes I made money, sometimes I didn't. Now that I'm a subcontractor, with the money I make, I've been able to buy land and rent it out to the project. Business has taken off. Before I could spend 5,000 euros and only get back half of that. Now I earn 8,000 or even 10,000. I'm part of this fisheries subcontracting group and I'm also on the board of directors. I'm involved in politics too. I'm a member of the Awami League. I have a high position there. For me, it's not just about my own profit. I also think about the community. I'm involved in two fisheries, but I absolutely do not use my position to further my own interests. Not all shareholders have the desire or the means to work for the fishery. Many factors come into play. Land area, income, family size, number of children in school, ambition, age or health. Some people are quite happy to open a convenience store, snack bar or small cafe. Technically, we are at the peak of production. Generally speaking, the natural yield is 0.15 kilograms per hectare in the open water. In our fisheries, it's four tons per hectare. So you can see how far we've come. It's a major leap forward. How are you? Okay, let's get to work. You're from Chapatoli, right? Then you go to work near Chapatoli, and you go to the area you're in charge of. Come by the office after work this afternoon to clock out. Okay? Go. Sundar, I still do. I'm not only some detail. 
We worked really hard, day and night, to get this far. We learned what kind of farming works with what fish. We were clueless. You have to start one thing at a certain time and another thing at a different time. We didn't know when to begin the production of our tilapia, for example. We released them way too early in the winter. We didn't know when to start production, when to feed the fish, when to give medicine. But now we know all this and production has increased. We want to continue investing, but there are problems. We had to end the harvest by a certain date, and so the fish sells at very low prices. Everyone brings their fish to market at the same time, so it sells for a very low price. We're planning to build cold storage so that we can keep the fish and sell it throughout the year. But for now, Ibrahim and the other subcontractors have a solution that is not to everyone's taste. Almost all of us are farmers. And for farmers, it's the rice that comes first. The fish comes second. It's just extra money. But we've noticed that since we started subcontracting the fishery, some of the people in charge have not kept their word. There are two water gates on either side, and they were supposed to be opened in late November to let the water out, so that we could till and sow at the right time of year. But they want to keep the fish around longer so that they grow, so they don't let the water out. They keep it in with gates and dams. It's a way to make more money, and in the meantime, the farmers suffer. To harvest rice, you need 10 to 12 workers. And because there's still water here, no one wants to work. You understand? Look, that's the drainage pipe. See how slowly the water is flowing? How many days will that take? If they'd opened the gate, it would have been dry in three days. Alerted by a few unhappy landowners, Kulsum goes to take a look for herself. You'll just have to talk to the manager this afternoon. Why is this a problem? I already spoke to him this morning. What did he say? That all the gates had been opened. They were opened over there. No, here too. No, it was over there. But the gates were supposed to be opened here as well. Amid Bai? Brother, we'd agreed that all the gates would be lifted. Where I'm standing, they're not open. The water's not draining. I'm with the farmers. The water's not moving. Come and see for yourself. And these problems are all because of what? Because of the fish. If the water drained properly, we wouldn't have these troubles. Kulsum calls upon the subcontractors to fix this water problem once and for all. Look, for the farmers, it's the rice that's important. The fish come second. Take a look around. There's still water in the low fields. Everyone's complaining. People are having trouble sowing and harvesting the rice. The flood water gates need to be lifted. And remove the metal sheeting too. 
All the gates are open. Now, if you have any special requests or need help, you must contact the board. You're a farmer too, a farmer's son, and I'm a farmer's wife. We all want the rice harvest to be good, so we have to fix this water problem. Yes, we agree. And we hope our efforts will be fruitful. You too must pray for that. More than anything, we want this project to be successful. That way, you can help us too. The water's not draining? Of course it's draining. The water will go away if you open the gates. Does she own any land? Of course I do. You have land? I was elected director. You stood for election and now you're talking about water not draining? Why don't you just take 500 euros from your share, buy an electric pump and use it to drain the water? Or give it to the three of us. We'll get your water drained. I think that when you're focused on business, the main goal becomes profitability. And when profitability is the only thing that matters, many people no longer care about the interests of the individual. It's classic behavior. You see it in every domain. The focus is on protecting the capital, increasing investment and earning profits. And we no longer worry about the people at the base of the pyramid. They are forgotten. This neoliberalism, which we see operating across the globe, affects Bangladesh. I'm talking about the free market economy. Farmers who have very little land come and tell me they used to earn more in one season selling fruit than what they earn today with the money from two, three or four fish seasons. Between seasons, they used to grow watermelon, peanuts, corn and other produce. They grew a lot of jute. Today they can't do any of that. They also tell me that they have cows and that before they could give them water hyacinths to eat or else dry water hyacinths to make fire. All of that's been taken away from them. What is this project bringing them? They're just given a bit of money every year, but they're not satisfied. They don't want the fishery. That's what the very small landowners are thinking. If one day the project works, and farmers can harvest their rice properly, if there's no metal or plastic sheeting holding back the water for too long, then farmers will no longer have a problem with it. I never thought the fishery would make me rich. I still spend as much time farming as I did before. I still have a lot of work. My goal is to make sure that poor people don't get cheated. Those who have more land, those who have power must not be allowed to rule the roost and ignore them. I'd rather not say anything. Let the project continue. Anyway, I can't stop it alone. I'm not the only landowner, there are many of us. If the fields aren't dry by the end of the month, then at the next meeting, everyone will be there with their ballots, and the farmers who voted in favor of the lease system, well, they'll all throw their ballots to the ground. This year, Mr. Morshed has revised the terms of the contract to make sure this situation would not happen again. Today is auction day for the Shanto fishery. Accompanied by the Board of Directors, Morshed plans to use this opportunity to impose new rules on the bidders. 
Hello and welcome to everyone. We are here today to bid on subcontracting the fishery. In the presence of the directors, I call this meeting to order. To facilitate fish farming during the 2015 and 2016 monsoons, we intend to subcontract the management of the fishery. Each participant in this public call for tender must issue a letter of credit of 5,000 euro to the Shanto project. As part of their management duties, subcontractors of the Shanto project must drain the water to allow for the cultivation of rice on November the 15th in the western fields. The remaining fields must be dry by December the 10th at the latest. You don't even provide a motorboat. How do you expect us to feed the fish or sell them? You didn't talk about a motorboat. Where is it? You really expect us to spend 5,000 euros on a project we'll only be managing for two years? Regarding point number two, I'd like to make the following changes. You wrote that payment is due within 21 days. I'd like that to be 30 days. You also wrote that it has to be in a lump sum, but I'd like to pay 60% first and the remaining 40% 15 days later. The previous offer was at 140,000, 140,000, 140,000. I say 50,000. Look, there are three other bidders, but now I'm talking to you, Abu. Come on, raise your bid. No, 50,000. You said 140,000? That's what was bid two years ago. Now it's two years later, and I'm not going over 50,000. Okay, 50,000, 50,000. Who says 60,000? I've got 60,000. Anyone for 60,000? 86,000? Who says 60,000? Who says 86,000? 87,000. Who says 70,000? 70,000. Fazrul Bai, 50,000. 82,500. Who says 85,000? Who says 85,100? 85,100. We're counting on your cooperation. If you think you've reached your limit, if that's what we're to understand, then we'll have to think about it. You have your needs, but this falls far short of our expectations. So, the four of you who are bidding, what do you say? Are we really at an impasse? The lease system was set up four years ago, four whole years. And those of us who invested aren't getting the profits we were expecting. Thank you for your point of view. The board will now convene. We'll let you know our decision later on today. Thank you. If the bidders are refusing the terms of the contract, it's because they'd agreed not to go over 90,000 euro, in other words, 40,000 euro less than at the last auction. They also hoped to pick up some extra benefits along the way. A few days later, under pressure from the approaching monsoon, and to avoid putting the fish season and dividend payout at risk, Morshed and the board of directors are forced to accept the lower offer.
Before, when we went to buy fish, it wasn't so expensive. We got discounts. But it's not like that anymore. We have to pay the exact price. They don't give us even 100 grams more. Yes, it's a big fish. Hey, Russell Bai? Russell Bai? Are there eggs in there? The price of fish has really gone up. Before, a kilo of tilapia was worth 80 to 90 cents, one euro at most. Now it's one euro 20, one euro 30. At the end of the season, everyone used to be given a bit of fish for free. But poor people working in the fish industry don't get that anymore. They see it, it looks delicious, they'd like to have some, but they can't afford it. Before, they would simply wait, because they knew that at the end of the harvest, they'd be given some fish. But when we began subcontracting, everyone got shortchanged, and that breaks my heart. It's true, fish used to be available. People could eat as much as they wanted. But the subcontractors put their own money into this. Now, the way it works is that you get the money and we own the fish. We don't give the fish for free anymore. It's as simple as that. The project has become a business. It's commercial now. After 15 years, what's become more important? Is it the community aspect or the business aspect? That's something that really needs to be examined. In my opinion, the business side was favored because it was intensely developed. In the beginning, the human element was more important. But now, business is the priority. People benefit from the fishery, yes, but developing the business has become the main goal. Of course, if the company were to disappear, all of the development that it has brought would be lost. Have we built a large company by handing the keys to the people in power at the local level? Have we reinforced this power structure? Or have we been able to bring real benefits to the poor? That's the real issue. The water finally withdraws and unveils the first plots of land. The farmers immediately prepare to sow. It's one of the fishery's big advantages. The earth no longer needs to be cleared or given nutrients, for the soil is naturally fertilized by fish feed and waste. In areas outside the project, water hyacinths invade every part of the flooded land and need to be removed. It's a huge amount of work for all the farmers and very costly for large and mid-sized landowners who are obliged to hire help. In the past, water hyacinths grew everywhere during the monsoon, and there were no roads. Transport was a huge problem. The roads were really bad. It was very difficult to go to school or to the market. We could only get around by boat. Thanks to this project, we were able to build roads. We get around more easily. The children can go to school and there are lanes everywhere. Now that we raise fish, there are no more water hyacinths. 
And growing rice costs us less. We need less weeding, less fertilizer, less irrigation for the rice. We don't worry about any of that anymore. And the rice harvest is better. First fish, then rice in abundance. Big or small, rich or poor, the earth continues to be generous to all. Moni, have you eaten, my love? Yes, I've eaten. Moni, have you eaten? Did you go to school? You didn't go, did you? Abul Jabba. Twenty years ago, this place was hell. There were no lights. There was no electricity. No TV, no satellite dishes. People weren't as aware. We lived in precarious conditions. The fish reconnected us. It brought us closer. Before, if I needed something, I found it my village. There was no reason for me to go anywhere else. But the fishery made us travel. There are problems to solve, opportunities to pursue. Especially for the directors. If a house is damaged by a storm, you have to deal with it. Or if fish are being stolen. For many different reasons, people have had to connect. The first thing needed to build a strong community, to build real ties between the people, creating real ties is the most important step in building a sense of community togetherness. You can always train people and talk to people, but it's when you have a concrete project that it really works. That's what creates strong ties and fosters innovation, community living, and the capacity to resolve their concerns. Stand 
The poor man was turned into a businessman. Maybe it wasn't possible to make his business grow, but at least he rose to be a businessman. That was a great innovation to start with. Now, has this man been able to keep his position? That, of course, is something we must examine. <laughs> Big shareholders will always seek greater profits, and those at the base of the pyramid, who are also shareholders, will want to assert their rights. The whole community must now put their heads together and find the right balance. How can the small shareholder be given a real place? How can we ensure that he is respected? Between these two extremes, it must be possible to find a compromise. This is a challenge not only for Shashuk, but for all the big initiatives like this in Bangladesh.